be lost without it. We're already late. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> oh, we fit in here. Okay, so according to um, the uh, Albert, there are 39 of you. And I said 35. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, there's two sheets going back. Uh, if you are not registered on Albert, or if you're not sure, or if you don't remember, or if you just enjoy writing your name, write your name on the sheet along with your email address. Write it clearly because we're going to use that to send you email after the class and sign you up for Piazza, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, if you are sure you're signed up on Albert, then no problem. Just let it go and we already have your email. Okay? Also going around is a one-page description of the course. That's the only piece of paper you're going to get from us. Well, the other one is the sign-up sheet. Um, and you can hold on to that for reference if you want it. It's also online already. Okay. Uh, so you're, if you're in the right room, you're here for math tools. Uh, this is the first morning of the semester. Um, so everybody's waking up and recovering from a holiday weekend. So that's good. Um, what can I say? I, I'm going to try to... I just see this coming. I'm going to have days and days of complaining about the about the markers on the H the HV system for the, for, uh, this screen. So I will try to get it out of the way in the first half an hour. <laughs> um, okay. So this is a course. I'm not, actually, let me introduce everybody yeah. first. So I'm Arrow. This is Mike. Mike Landy. Hello. And in the back are our three TAs: uh, Jue and Lyndon and Yonatan all sitting in the back manning the camera. I like that. Person. Um, what's that? I said person in the camera. Yes, something like <laughs> that. Uh, person in the camera. Um, if, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Um, that's, that's pretty much it. That's all I need to tell you. Um, so, and, and you guys, please chime in if I forget to say something, because I'm already feeling a little scattered. It's like three minutes into the class, and I'm scattered already. It's a good sign. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about the class. Um, this is a class that was, and the reason I'm telling you about this is because you should, you should know the history of this class because this is a class that was um, basically driven by student demand. Right. When I came here, I, I'm a theorist, and I came to NYU, I was thinking, what am I going to teach? Uh, I don't know if I really belong here. <laughs> and the students answered my question. They came and they said, uh, we need a course that teaches us what all this stuff is. We go to meetings, we read papers, we read about analyses, we, read it, we hear about models, and we don't know what anybody's talking about. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of buzzwords, there's a lot of words from different fields. It depends on whether somebody is a mathematician, or they're a physicist, or they're an engineer, or they're a computer scientist. And when we hear about these models, we don't know what they're talking about. Um, so the students basically had this request that they wanted a course that would cover something about um, data analysis and modeling, or neuroscience, and um, so I said, that sounds great, it sounds hard, it sounds like a lot of material, let's get together and um, next week. And I got together with five or six of them, I said, please, please bring a list of all the things that you think you'd like to know, things you've heard about, things that you're curious about, things that didn't make sense to you, you went to a poster at a meeting and, it did, and you couldn't figure it out, uh, you saw it in a paper, or you have your own data that you've been messing with and trying to figure out and you don't know what to do. Come tell me about the problem. So we spent a whole day walking. We had a huge list. It was insane um, of everything you can imagine um, and more. And um, and then I went away for three weeks and thought about, okay, how do I turn this into a course without making a mess of it? And so this course is the result of that, or this course is was initiated by that process. So I'm telling you this again because it was the students that told me what they wanted. And we turned it into something that I think of as sort of the fundamentals or the bedrock on which all um, tools, all ideas for modeling and analyzing data are built. So I'm gonna, we're going to try to give you um, something that is useful for you in the future and provides a nice foundation on which you can build. We're not going to go down the path of trying to describe every possible analysis you can do on every kind of data. That doesn't make sense and obviously doesn't fit in one course. Okay. So that's just a little bit of history. Um, about something like 10 years ago, we merged the course with um, the psychology CMP. Uh, they had a course also that was more statistics oriented. We merged the two courses and turned it into uh, math tools for neuroscience and, and cognitive science. Yeah. Neuro and cognitive science, there it is. 
And so that's the course that you are currently enrolled in. Some, some of you I know are coming from psychology, some of you are from neuroscience, some of you are from neither of the above, some of you are coming from outside the university. Uh, um, is that true? Uh, anybody here from outside of NYU? Usually are a couple. Yeah, but we've driven them all the way. Yeah, it's difficult to register from outside of NYU, even though it's supposed to be uh, doable. It's too, complicated. Too for linguistics, otherwise it's all Okay. Well, you never know who's going to show up, but that's what we have for that. Okay. So that's it for history. Um, and the course, and the other comment about uh, telling you the history is that the course is still evolving. So every year we do this a little differently. Every year some material gets shifted around. Every year Mike and I, uh, the last four years, I guess, um, at least three, maybe four, have tried to kind of revamp chunks of the statistics section, and we've done that again this year. And every year we get um, some things right, and we get some things not quite right. Please give us feedback. We're, we're looking to you guys again. You guys originated the course, and you can help make it better for the people that come next. You can even make it better for yourselves this year if we have time to react to something about it. So if you know something that's not making sense, uh, we're looking for your feedback. We need your feedback. Okay. Um, the course, uh, one more comment about the, about, uh, the course sort of setup. Um, it's required for CMS and, and, um, and for CMP students, um, but waivers can be allowed if you feel like you're in over your head. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, you got to get out early, like within two weeks or something. I can't forget when the drop date is. Um, and that's not meant to scare you away. We would like you all to take the course, and if you're up for it, you should go for it. Um, but if you feel like you're going under, then uh, there may not be a way back. So it'll be, you should come talk to us, either Mike or I or any of the TAs at any point if you're feeling like that's happening, okay? All right, um, let's see, what do I need to tell you now? So the, way, the easiest way to describe a little bit about how the course is gonna go, the flavor of the course is to go through the title and explain basically those first two words, okay? So this is, I know this is a math course. Some of you are probably terrified about that. Um, some of you are um, probably thinking, wow, great, I haven't had math in a while. I'm excited about this. Um, in what sense is it a math course? And in particular, how does it differ from like a typical course in neuroscience or in psychology? Um, neuroscience in particular, the courses are very um, sort of fact-oriented. And a math course is, is um, very conceptually oriented. And it, it is also um, something usually math, you build an edifice, you construct an edifice that's sort of self-consistent. The idea is to put together pieces that are consistent with each other and that relate to each other in a way that is um, it's sort of artificial, but it is self-consistent. In science, of course, that's not really what we're aiming for. We're aiming for explaining reality. Reality is complicated, and what we're doing is coming up with partial explanations based on the observations and measurements we can make. So math meets science in an interesting and important way, and that's more and more important in modern science. And so that's basically why this course exists, to help you um, understand some math that you can use to do your science. For most of you, you're not going to be theorists. You're going to be experimentalists, and you're thinking about data. And so this course is really for you to understand how to, how to use math and to use computing, because that's a modern component that's essential in all of this math, um, to analyze data to model data and to understand and to do science. Um, but the course is structured like a math course in the sense that it is, uh, that everything we're going to do uh, builds, um, it is conceptually motivated. We're going to try to show you an idea. We're going to tell you where it comes from. We're going to tell you when it is appropriate, when it can be used. And after you go and understand how to use it, maybe how to write code for it and how to write out the math, we're going to actually show you how you interpret what comes out the other end. So when you've done all of that, you stick your data in, you do some calculation, some analysis, now what? What do I learn from that? And why did I do it in the first place? So, so it's different from a math course in that we're going to be thinking about that whole process, not just the math. But it is like a math course because it is not recipe oriented. In this, in this class, we are, you know, I'm really strongly opposed to the view of it. Math is usually delivered to audiences like this, the way statistics is usually taught. I'm a strong believer that you, you guys should understand where things came from. Why do we use this tool? Under what conditions does it work? You know, in a sense, you should understand how to derive it. And we're not going to do a lot of proofs here, but we are going to try to show you where everything comes from so you can reason about it and use it um, as a sort of 
well-educated math user. Okay. So the course is um, cumulative. Um, this is really critical, and it's a, it's the it's the classic mistake or problem that people run into in this class. If you are used to taking classes where you take a bunch of notes and write down a bunch of things, and then the next week you take a bunch of notes and write down a bunch of things, and one week is not really particularly related to the previous week and doesn't depend on it, um, you cannot be in that mode in this class. This class is um, everything we do builds on what has happened before. The sequence is very carefully chosen um, to do that. And what we will do starting today in about 10 minutes is going to matter all the way till the very last lecture. So if you miss a class or if you don't understand a chunk, you have to get on top of it. You have to spend some time outside of class reading the notes, watching the video, going to the TA's office hours, etc. It's It's absolutely critical. It's the most important thing. And the, the way people get into trouble with, in this class is by skipping a couple of lectures and then thinking, ah, oh, well, I'll catch up later. And if you skip two lectures and you go to the next lecture, you will not understand what's going on. Oh, okay. there's a solution for that. There is a solution. The videos are online. We have no, we're going to put slides online that we're available and the TAs are available to help you and walk you through material if you don't understand it. But it's pretty critical to stay on top of it. Do you have another solution? No, that's okay. Okay, so content is cumulative. And the last thing is that um, so equations, um, many people are scared of equations. I'm a little scared of equations. Unless you're a real mathematician, you're probably a little scared of equations. Um, you are going to see equations. We're going to write equations on the board because you have to know how to notate these things compactly. You have to know how to communicate them if you ever write it in the paper, like in the method section of your paper, you'll need to be able to write down math. And you have to be able to read other people's papers. But we are going to try wherever possible to give you pictures, diagrams, geometry, uh, other ways of thinking about things, not just the equation, and also code or pseudocode, a way of thinking about things algorithmically. And the combination of those three things, the equations, the pictures, and the sort of code or algorithms, are usually something that helps for most students. It doesn't work for everybody, but for most of you, I think it will help you to really cement and understand how to, how to fit these ideas together. Okay, um, right, so there's this nice quote from Mads uh, about making calculations, and he calls them graphs. Make calculations and graphs. Both sorts of outputs should be studied, and each contributes to understanding. So that's kind of the idea. You're going you're gonna to do computing. You're also going to see equations. You're also going to draw pictures. And all three of those things, are gonna, you can put those together, are going to really help you to understand and have a good intuition and, and, um, and a sort of deep way of understanding how work and how they're connected. Okay, so um, what else do I need to tell you? Right, tools. So why, why is the word tools there? Because these things are not, for most of you, these things are not the goal of your research. You are not mathematicians. You are not um, applied mathematicians. You are people that want to use these things in order to achieve other goals, and your goals are typically science. Um, that's the assumption. So the goal is to um, give you these things so that you can use them. It's, it's a practical course. And that's why you know, everything we're going to do, you're going to practice, you're going to implement, you're going to put together in homework and do, you're going to implement on a computer um, using MATLAB. Um, the course is usually done in MATLAB. I'll say more about that in a moment. And um, right, so that's that point. Okay? Lots of implementation, lots of exercises. You're going to, you know, most people learn by doing. So, the, the way, what often happens is we're writing equations, we're showing you pictures on the board, it all sort of makes sense, and then all of a sudden you realize when you sit down to actually do something that it's, you didn't understand as well as you thought you did. It's a very common experience, don't panic, step back, reason about it, and uh, work your way through it and get help from us and the TAs, is the, is the best advice I can give you. Okay, I think that's it for sort of describing what the course is about. This is a picture that um, is, is meant to convey uh, what I just said to you, which is that you're going to be learning these. So this, this is math. It's about um, chunks of, and concepts that fit together and are interrelated and connected with each other in, in very interesting and multifaceted ways. The relationship between different ideas in this course, there are many, many ways to bridge between these ideas. So you should think of it as a very complicated mesh. 
And of course, because, um, because of the way time works and the way communication works, I'm, we're going to stand here and deliver ideas to you sequentially and serially. Uh, but what we're really doing is climbing over some sort of mesh. And your job is to try to um, take what Mike and I and the TAs have in our minds, which is that some chunk of that mesh and the relationship between all these ideas. And uh, your job is to, our job is to help you assemble that in your heads. So we're going to walk over this thing following some path, and you're going to be assembling things as it goes, and you're supposed to build something inside your head that's kind of like what other people in the field have that know these tools and know these principles. Right? So this is, this is how communication works, and this is how math works, and math and really, I think, concepts in general. So we're going to do that again by giving you kind of three different three different axes, so these are nicely triangulated to um, represent three different axes. We're going to give you that by giving you three different ways of thinking about or climbing over this thing. One, geometric reasoning. I told you about pictures. One is the mathematical manipulation, notation, equations, and one is computer implementation. Okay, so you're going to use all three of those things to understand the relationships between these nodes, these ideas, and you're going to connecting them up as you go. And if you don't put the work in to do that, to assemble that, then it's not really going to work. You can't learn these things in isolation. They're related to each other. They're connected to each other. And the more you think about that, the more you're going to get out of it. We can't do the thinking for you, but we can try to point out the connections as we go. OK. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about this. This is what you already have in your hands. I, there's not that much for me to say about it. You can read it um, offline. But it basically says, in a little bit more detail, some of the things that I already told you. Um, anything I need to tell you about oh, prerequisites, I didn't mention that in case any of you were wondering. There really aren't any prerequisites. The, the prerequisite is being able to think logically and rationally and to put in hard work to do that. Um, you need to know sort of basic algebra, trigonometry, and calculus. We're going to be using those immediately starting today. Um, linear algebra is really helpful. It's, you'll see it's the first part of the course, so if you've already had a course in linear algebra, that'll, that'll go pretty easily for the first couple of weeks. If you have never seen linear algebra, you'll have to work harder, but it is doable by people that don't know it. Um, in addition, if you have some programming experience, that'll come in handy. It'll help you to get started faster. If you've never programmed a computer, you will, you will manage it as doable, but you're going to have to work harder in the beginning. Um, and uh, I already said, well, the format of the course is, you probably all know this, the course meets twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday, chapter 12, here. Uh, there's a lab on Fridays. It's kind of roughly every other Friday, but the schedule's a little bit complicated. And in the beginning, we're front-loaded with three very rapid labs to get you started in MATLAB programming. If you haven't programmed before, those are essential. If you've done some programming but not in MATLAB, you might want to stick your head in for part of those just to get a sense of how MATLAB works. If you've already done a lot of MATLAB programming, you can probably skip it. Or come along to help your classmates, your choice. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is that the, the grades are primarily based on the homework. The homework is hard. The homeworks come out every two weeks. Um, they will not come out immediately. They'll wait till we have a little bit of content. Uh, but it's basically every two weeks. There are six of them. Um, they are difficult. If you <coughs> if we hand it out, you have two weeks to do it, and you wait to start it the day before, it is going to be tough. Even if you've done a fair amount of programming, and even if you've already seen the math, it's going to be, they're still, they take time. So do not do that. Get started the first week, and then your second week will not be miserable. Um, they do take a lot of time. And if you have not done these things before, or haven't done any of these things for a long time, uh, they will take longer. That's, that's sort of obvious. OK. Um, anything else I want to tell you? I, so, Topics that we're going to cover in this course, you know, I told you a little bit about where it came from. And the, part of the reason that it keeps evolving is because the fields, the field keeps evolving. And I think probably many of you know that um, statistics as a field is really undergoing a, I, I would call it a revolution. I don't know if anybody in the field would agree, but basically the, the, the introduction of computing to statistics is completely and profoundly changing the way you think about it solving problems in statistics the way we think about um, evaluating statistics, etc. And I think you all know this. Sometimes people call it the data science revolution. Sometimes people call it the machine learning or the AI revolution. All these things are connected and overlapped. 
Um, and so this is changing also the way we think about this course and the way you folks going into the, your various uh, subfields are experiencing um, analyses and data, data analysis, statistics, and processing and, and modeling data. So we, have, we are sort of slowly upgrading and integrating things into the course where we see fit. This is not a course on machine learning. It is not a sort of general data science course. But you'll see reflected in it um, chunks that would, be, that would fall under those labels. And kind of, you know, if you want to think broadly about it, uh, here's a, an attempt at a Venn diagram. I mean, there's lots of sort of classical ideas coming from linear algebra and linear systems theory um, and statistics, and then sort of more modern ideas, um, starting with uh, revolutions in optimization that started, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, and the more modern machine learning and kind of data science paradigms. So what we're going to do is going to borrow from all of those things, but we're obviously not going to cover all of those things. Like these, are, these are whole fields unto themselves. We're going to be trying to give you, again, the foundation, like the bedrock that you would use, actually, um, to think about all of those things. OK. And there, this is at the bottom of the sheet that you have. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details of the topics that are listed here. Um, but I will point out that um, everything we do unrolls kind of in real time as we go through the semester on the web page. The web page is here. It's been here for a long time. If you want to see web pages from previous instantiations, of course, including last year, you can type the same HTML address and put uh, the last two digits of the year afterwards. So if you type math tools 18, you'll get last year's, and you can see the entire semester worth of material. Um, this points, as of this morning at 9.30, this points to a new one that is empty, except for today's lecture. OK. Uh, anything else? Right. Logistics, I already told you this. Labs, I already told you that. Uh, the first three are very rapid introduction to MATLAB. First one is Friday, this Friday, like in three days. Okay. So we have a lecture on Thursday, and there's a lab on Friday next week. We will replace one of the lecture slots with a lab, because we're trying to front load the labs and get you guys up to speed uh, on programming that you're going to need right away for the homework. So we're going to have two labs next week. It'll be on the schedule uh, shortly. I'll put it on one. Um, another announcement. Handouts. We will put the slides and, the, and some notes online. There's no textbook for the class. There's tons of material on this stuff. You guys, in the old days, we would, we would point to books and various things that you could, um, you could chapters of books that you could download. These days, um, Google moves faster than we do. If you want to find something, you're probably going to find it faster and, and better on Google than, than we can even deliver it to you. So we'll, we have links and things on the web page, um, some of those. I hope they're all working. It's possible some of them have gone dead. Um, but you will also be, I'm sure, searching for your own materials. And if you find something that you think is really good and really useful, please let us know. Uh, and we can try to link it for other students to also benefit from. Homework. I told you all this already. Six problem sets. You're going to have to write some math, but not a lot. You're going to be writing code quite a lot. Um, and you will be visualizing, plotting, graphing, sort of looking at things, testing things by examining them geometrically and graphically. Um, and I already told you about the grading. Um, One thing. Yes. Um, labs are usually on Fridays, but we want to get you up to speed with programming quickly. So in fact, this coming Tuesday, a week from today, will be lab two. So it'll be two labs next week. Tuesday and Friday. Yeah, we'll have a lecture on Thursday, but Tuesday will be a lab. One extra lab next week. OK. Um, a little bit more detail about the homework. I, I hate doing this on the first day, but it, 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 it has become, uh, well, it seems that it's necessary to issue some statements and warnings. Maybe we should do this again when we hand out the first homework. But, but I'll say it now, and maybe we'll say it again at that point. Um, first, the homework is generally due in two weeks. I already told you this. Ration your time. Do not start the day before. Start in the first week, and then you will not be miserable the second week. Um, you are expected to solve the problems in a way that demonstrates that you understand the concepts and the tools. Okay? So that means uh, two things uh, that are both of these points. First, you can't just look up a canned piece of software in Google or on the, on the internet, or even use one of the built-in things in MATLAB that just does the thing we're asking you to work through. 
Um, because if you do that, it doesn't show that you actually understand it. If we ask you to implement and work through something from scratch, then you have to write it out and implement it from scratch. You can check it against something else, verify that it's working, but you are expected to write it out to show that you understand it. Okay? It should be obvious, and if the questions are worded in such a way that say this, but every year we get somebody who says, can I just use the, the regress function to solve the regression problem? And the answer is no. You can, when you understand what regression is, and you understand how to think about it, and when it works and when it doesn't work, then you can use the regress function. But before that, you don't have a license to use the regress function. You have to write it out. You have to write out the path to <coughs> understand what you're doing. OK. That's, and that's the purpose of the course. So that's why we're insisting on this, OK? If you're not sure, ask. Okay. All right. Um, the last thing is uh, you are encouraged. You learn from each other. You're probably going to learn more from each other than you're going to learn from us. And we know that. And we want you to talk about things, discuss things, reason about things. But when you go to write your code, write your own code. You can't send somebody else your code or take somebody else's code and just stick it into your homework. It's kind of obvious. This is you know, an undergraduate lesson. What we find that we have to say this, in any case, many of you were undergraduates as recently as June. So um, write your own code. Uh, cheating will be penalized. I, I hate to even say it, but it will. Uh, so you have to write your own code. You're expected to think through and work through the problems and write them out yourself. Discuss them. Discuss them with the TAs. Discuss them with us. But when you go to write it, write your own. Okay. All right. Are there any questions and from the TAs or from Mike? Did I miss anything? When are we talking about how to handle it? Yeah, so the, the TAs will talk about how to hand in the homework, and if we do what we did last year, what we will do is give you a mini homework. It doesn't count toward your grade, but it's for you to practice some MATLAB stuff and give you a chance to hand in something that looks like what you will have to hand in when you do the real homeworks. So that's an attempt to sort of regularize and formalize exactly how the hand in works and what you're supposed to include in the file and things like that. So that you guys are going to do that this year, right? because we had the one from last year that's like that. Yes, uh, Maybe now's a good time to add that we're aware that those who took the boot camp prior uh -huh. to this course, uh, the boot camp was in Python because the instructors, instructors were very enthusiastic about using Python. And all three of us can use Python as well. So if you want to continue using Python, it might be a little bit difficult to get things to work because a lot of the functions and data sets are in MATLAB. But it is doable and it's been done in the past. So if you'd like to uh, submit your assignments in Python in the form of Jupyter notebooks, that is OK with us. How many people are thinking they want to do it in Python? OK, that number's going up um, pretty noticeably every year. That was inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, there were a few. The year before, I think there were two. Um, so OK. It's good. It's good for Mike and I, too, because you know, at some point, I suspect we will shift the course over to Python. Um, I don't feel like we're ready to do that yet. I think that is a harder starting point for most students uh, if you haven't done any computer programming. But um, this is the way the world is moving, and so people, people will eventually get dragged, kicking and screaming. It's kind of like having to use this TV screen. Um, does anybody own a TV like this? That thing. Better not say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare. Okay. All right. Let's. Um, yes. Questions. Questions. Um, Sorry. So if you yes. submit codes in Python, does the version matter? Because I think like some things change. Yeah. So I mean, this is part of the problem that Python, and this is sort of the reason that I was avoiding it for like ten years. That it's, it's there's a lot of churn because it's basically open software, and it's, de it's developed by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. Um, things are constantly shifting and juggling around. Um, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, you guys want to give specifications for version numbers? Yeah, please submit in Python 3. Yeah, I was going to say, probably we have to insist on 3 oh, yeah. instead of 2. 2 is pretty deprecated at this point. It's been a lot of years. Um, but I, if you have something, I can't imagine that we're doing anything so sophisticated that it will matter with the, the micro version you're using. But 
but not those are equally use the functions and have to do it on right. raw. That right. part should be pretty common, hopefully. But these these are famous last words, so you know, <laughs> there's a pretty decent chance something will something will break. Um, but I think the TAs well, we'll consult with the TAs about how to handle the versioning. If, if you guys have recommendations, think think about that, and maybe you can deliver those recommendations in the, in the lab. Other thoughts, questions, anxieties. Anybody need like a therapy session? We can stop for five minutes. There's a couch out there. We can sit and discuss. No, nobody. Everybody's good. All right. Yeah. So that'll that'll be online. But um, I did. In fact, I just made us a new Piazza site. Um, we don't use NYU's um, classes system. Although this year we couldn't. I guess we could have this year. Yeah. So so traditionally we've not used that. We've used a free thing called Piazza, which is. Um, Know, a messaging and posting system that lets us make announcements and deliver, uh, let you know when stuff is available, and it lets you guys ask questions. You can ask questions of each other, you can ask questions of the teammates or us, and we will chime in and answer those as we can. Um, you will all get signed up for it this afternoon. As soon as we have all of your email addresses, we will just dump them into Piazza and you'll get an email inviting you to, to join that. Um, it's worked pretty well. Um, and the reason we're using that instead of the NYU system is because every year there have been problems getting people from outside of the university enrolled in the non in the NYU system. So and that causes delays for them. So we're like two weeks into the class and they still can't get onto the internal system and they're still having trouble with their ID card, et cetera. So so we're trying we've been trying to make it easier for those folks. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are none of you this year. Yeah, this is the first time it looks like it's I think in, in many years, yeah. actually at least a few. Okay. Other thoughts, questions? We're all good. Okay. Let's let's um, let's do something real. We're going to start with linear algebra. Why are we starting with linear algebra? Why would we do that? Um, I get asked that question basically every year, um, and there's sort of uh, two answers. One is that I think it's the most useful mathematical tool we have for um, dealing with data. I hope you will agree after you learn some things about it. It is also um, a, t it is a set of concepts, ideas, and mathematics that underlie um, essentially everything we do in multiple dimensions with data, and also a huge chunks of engineering, physics, um, and other fields. Right? And it's also, the fund I think, probably the most fundamental aspect that underlies machine learning and modern uh, data science. So we're going to start with linear algebra. This is not a linear algebra course. Normally, if you take a linear algebra course, it's a whole semester. There's a great book written by Gilbert Strain uh, um, from MIT, which I recommend if you really want to learn your linear algebra thoroughly. What we're going to do is we're going to do um, about three weeks, not even, I think it's like two and a half weeks of linear algebra, really rapid. And we're going to do that by, um, first of all, not covering everything you would normally cover, obviously. And we're going to cheat. So instead of what happens is that in a linear algebra course, you um, it's normally if you want to derive everything from scratch, it takes an entire semester to get to what I consider the gem of the field. We're going to get to the gem of the field, I think next time, <laughs> maybe on Thursday, possibly next week. So we're that's so what we do is we cheat a little. We're not going to give you a formal proof. One piece of it will just be stated as a fact. And you'll have to trust us and 200 years of mathematics that that, that fact is correct and carefully checked. Um, and, and, but from that, you will be able to do essentially almost everything else in linear algebra can be done using that particular gem. It's called the SVD, the Singular Value Decomposition. So we're going to get to that very quickly. So today, we're going to start building toward that, and we're going to go quickly. Um, but for, some, for those of you that already know this stuff, it won't be so quick. You'll, maybe you'll just see it a little bit differently. Okay. Um, here's a quote from the author of the book I just mentioned, Linear Algebra, and he wrote that quote in, I don't know, the 80s maybe? Linear Algebra is as basic and applicable as calculus, unfortunately it is easier. And I, I agree with that quote. Um, all of you take calculus. Calculus is usually required in high school. You probably took, many of you probably took several years of calculus. I think it's a shame you didn't also get told to take Linear Algebra. Actually, how many of you actually had Linear Algebra? This number also goes up every year. 
So it might be a third of the class. I got that hand count right. About a third, okay. It should be all, but it's but that's maybe that's decades away. It goes up every year. Okay. The entities we're going to work with are vectors. And we don't have an eraser, so that's an entity that yeah. um, let me uh Where? The the I think it's imaginary. Oh, oh. there it is. Ah. <laughs> nice. So they put a white thing on a white thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is like, you know when you're in nursery school and you get a little tiny board? <laughs> really? I'm done. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> okay. I'm not a fan of whiteboards. I'm not a fan of TV monitors. I like things old school. Okay. All right, so this is a vector. A vector is a collection of numbers, an ordered collection of numbers. I thought that's all it is. A finite, typically, to this class, for everything we're going to do, it's a finite set. It has a dimensionality. We're going to call it its dim the dimensionality, which is the number of numbers. Um, so this, these are labeled x1, x2, x3, down, dot, dot, dot means, and so on, until we get to the N, which is X sub N. Capital N is the uh, label that we we'll usually use notationally for the dimensionality. That's the number of numbers, right, that are in this stack, okay? And then we'll indicate a vector by using a variable like X and putting a line over it or an arrow over it, or sometimes we'll put a little hat over it. I'll explain the differences as we go. Um, so that's a shorthand, this shorthand with the vector over it, the little arrow, is a shorthand for that, that stack of numbers. Okay. Straightforward. And, um, and the order matters. That, that is basically indicated by the notation. So everything in math is very compact and very well formulated over lots and lots of years, centuries, um, to try to convey the essence of what's going on with a minimal amount of um, Stuff. So this is not a paragraph description. It's just a letter with a vector over it, a little, uh, with an arrow over it. Okay? And that is supposed to unpack in your mind into something that is a stack of numbers or a collection of numbers that um, I'll give you more interpretation about in just a second. OK, so everybody's good with notation. These little subscripts are telling you which, which, which version you're looking at. And by the way, that kind of stuff gets done differently by different people in different contexts. Sometimes. It's drawn as subscripts the way it is here. Sometimes people write um, you know, square brackets. You'll see some textbooks or papers where people will write something like that. That means the first element of x. When you're writing code, you will have other ways of accessing elements of a vector. Um, so you'll see one of the frustrating things in math is that the notation is not standardized. It, it, in different subfields and even in the same field, you find people using slightly different notations. And you have to be able to sort of quickly convert or translate into, uh, in, in your head, into what those things mean. So we're going to, um, sometimes by accident and sometimes on purpose, we will be switching notations. If you're confused, ask. Um, but we will, we will try to point out when we do that or notice when we do that so that we don't have to sit there wondering, like, what does that mean? Okay? So subscripts here, sometimes written with square brackets or even with just regular parentheses. Sometimes superscripts, but, but subscripts are probably the most common, and that's what's written on the slide. Okay. So how do we think about this? If we're in small numbers of dimensions, like if at capital N is 2, then we can just think of this as a point on the plane. So the plane is this screen. Here's some axes, the horizontal and vertical line. Um, we can put a point over here. That's the vector x. Here, just with a bar over it. It should be an arrow, but it's a bar. Um, and it's, we can think of it as, we can draw this arrow, the red thing, from the origin of this coordinate system, two lines, um, the horizontal and vertical axes, from the origin to this location, and the two numbers that are inside of this, x1 and x2, are just the coordinates, right? There's the horizontal coordinate, we'll call that x1 by convention. The first coordinate is the horizontal one. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's convention. And the vertical one is x2, and this is just a position in the plane. The numbers could be... They're usually real numbers, so they can be positive or negative, anything you want. 
and they go out to infinity. Okay. All right. If it's in three dimensions, so n equals three, then we can still draw a picture. Now it's a little bit harder. Now it requires a little bit more artistry. Maybe if you're doing this in a, on a computer, you can draw this picture and you can spin it around because it's a three-dimensional thing. So when I'm talking about these things in the, in the lectures and when Mike is talking about these things in the lectures, we'll kind of stand here and wave our hands around as if we're thinking about three, three dimensions or we'll draw pictures with, with our pointers and rotate things around, okay? So three dimensions, you need three axes and the three numbers that are in the vector then correspond to the coordinates along those three axes, one, two, and three. Typically, three would be the vertical one off the plane. But if we're talking about, you know, if we wanted x1 and x2 to be this screen, then the third one would be out of the screen, okay, perpendicular to the screen, so we're pointing slightly angled down toward the floor. Okay, so that's three. And and so that's so. And what about one dimension? Well, I didn't even say, I didn't even mention that because there's no, you don't really do anything graphical with that. It's just a number. So a vector is just a generalization of our idea of a real number. Okay? It's several real numbers, some fixed number of them. And when n equals 1, it's just everything collapses to this, the case of just a single real number. We call that a scalar, okay? for those of you that haven't heard the word before. All right, so n equals 2. We're going to see lots of things in n equals 2. It's easy to reason about them. It's easy to draw the picture. So we're going to do lots of these. In fact, three quarters of the course will be pictures, assuming vectors that are two-dimensional, and then we'll always be pointing out, and, and this is the power of linear algebra, but almost everything we do will generalize to any number of dimensions. It doesn't just work in two. It'll work in a hundred dimensions. That's why it's so useful. So if you have a data set that involves recordings from 2,000 neurons, and um, you're looking at some complicated behavior that involves several different measurements, and you want to figure out how to relate the 2,000 neurons and their responses over time to the to some set of measurements that you make of an animal running down, running along a path or through a track. Um, you can use these kinds of data representations and you can use the tools that we're going to talk about to analyze and work with things in 2,000 dimensions. And you can reason about them by drawing pictures in two dimensions. So this is, you know, this is the theme of what we're going to be doing with linear algebra. We're going to be reasoning about things, drawing pictures, and trying to understand things in low dimensional spaces, and we're going to have to rely and trust and believe that many of those things that we're going to be doing down in two dimensions are going to generalize to, extrapolate to large numbers of dimensions where, where our data lie. So this is, this is the power of these tools. This is why they are the bedrock of all those fields that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So n equals 3. And what do we do after n equals 3? Well, uh, now we're in trouble. We can't do this anymore drawing things with coordinates. Um, so what we're going to typically do, and we'll do a lot of this, especially when we get to the second uh, or the third chunk of the course, um, we're going to take these numbers and we're going to plot them in this, sometimes this is called a spike plot. We're going to plot them as little lines off of an axis. The axis is discrete, so this is the first location, the second location, the third location, the fourth location, so it's indexed um, in MATLAB. The indices start with one, so this will be the first element, second element, third element, fourth element. In Python, the indices start with zero. So it's going to be very confusing, um, and, and it often is very confusing to have to switch back and forth between indexing. It's just plus or minus one, but it, it's one of those things that's a constant nuisance. Every time you're writing code, you have to be conscientious and thinking about, did I, do I have the indices right, or do I have to subtract one, do I have to add one? Which way am I going? Once you get used to, you know, basically either expecting that you'll make that mistake and you'll have to fix it, and recognizing when you've made that mistake, it's not a big deal. It takes five seconds to realize, oh, I'm, everything's off by one. I have to shift it over. Okay. So the indices, the way we're thinking about it here, we're labeling them starting with one. Okay. One, two, three. And these little lines, these little spikes, have a height. I didn't draw a vertical axis or, or any kind of scale, so you don't know what these numbers are. But um, the height is proportional to the value of that entry in the vector, right? And you can see here's a negative one, just to indicate they don't have to all be positive. Um, and there's a set of these. And in fact, if this is really long, you can start to think of it as like samples of some sort of a continuous function. And in fact, this is one of the major uses of, of, of this sort of technology and 
in terms of the technology is in thinking about representing signals in the real world, and in particular, think about sound. Okay, so you have a microphone, it records sound pressure waves, vibrations in the air, they come in and they shake some sort of diaphragm or, or some other sort of, well, we'll go into the details of the technology of microphones, but the idea is that eventually that gets turned into an electrical current or a voltage and recorded and measured. And typically, in the modern era, which would be, I don't know, since the, I think it was the kind of mid to late 80s, I guess, when CDs appeared. Before that, we used vinyl records. They've made a comeback. For those of you that have, how many of you have a, a record player? Anybody have an LP player? All right, so, so that number's going up every year, too. <laughs> it turned to the good old days. And someday we'll have blackboards in here. <laughs> and we'll just use chalk, and, and, and this will all be gone. That'll suck. That'll be great. <laughs> um, so CDs, what do you do? You, you take that sound pressure wave that's coming in, and you sample it. You measure the amplitude of that wave, and you measure it 44,000 times a second. 44 kilohertz is the sampling rate of a CD, uh, 44.1, I guess. I don't ask why, that's a strange number. It doesn't matter. They're, they're, so they're sampling very rapidly. They're measuring the, um, the displacement, basically. If, let, think of it as a microphone diagram, diaphragm. They're measuring the displacement at 44,000 times per second. And they're recording that displacement in a big vector. It's a really big vector because you need 44,000 of these things every second. So if you have an hour of music, you have 44,000 times 60, 60 seconds per minute times 60 minutes per hour times whatever it is, two hours on a CD or an hour and a half. It's a lot of samples, but that's what it is. It's basically samples of the sound pressure wave. So, so you can think in your mind, and we'll come back to this again in a few weeks, that there was a, these, these, what these really are is a representation, and it's a partial representation, of something that used to be a continuous signal, that microphone diagram that was moving back and forth, and was following some sort of wave, some sort of smooth continuous wave, and this device measured where was that thing at different moments, and these indices now correspond to time. They're not seconds, they're in units of 1 44,000th of a second, and the absolute time is, well, whatever the clock was, the atomic clock in Boulder at the moment when you started the recording. Um, but you can think of those samples on a CD as just these kinds of measurements. And um, there's another discretization that happened. So this is a, a discretization. This was a continuous wave, and we discretized in time, measured at specific moments in time, there's also a discretization in terms of these amplitudes. So those things, instead of representing floating point numbers or you know, real numbers, let's say, uh, what happens is those get quantized and they get measured you know, in usually 16-bit um, quantities. So that they'll take a 16-bit number. That's there are two to the 16 different values. And they'll spread those values out over some range. And those these amplitude values that this waveform is going through will be rounded off to the nearest one of those increments. Okay? So what actually gets stored on a CD is a 16-bit quantity 44,000 times a second for however many seconds you have to record. Okay. So all of that is just saying this, this is all around us. The world has now gone essentially completely digital. It used to be that many things were analog. What goes on an LP it's vinyl, and you record with little wiggles of the grooves on the vinyl platter um, what uh, something that is supposed to replicate what that, that microphone diaphragm was doing. And when you play it back, you drag a needle through it. The needle wiggles the same way the microphone diagram wiggled, and then you amplify that and send it through a stereo system to, to play back the music or whatever the sound source was. Now, there's a completely different process. You take that CD or you stream it digitally. By the way, if you're doing streaming and you're, you guys are big on Spotify or whatever it is that people use these days, Tidal, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's really kind of strange. You're going through these multiple conversions. You're taking, you take the original sound, you digitize it, discretize it in, in time, but also discretize it in amplitude, 
Those things then get compressed. That's a very complicated process. We'll talk more about that and things like it when we get, you know, again, a couple of weeks into the course. But basically, the raw numbers are not getting sent. Something much more compressed is getting sent. Um, those things are getting either stored in a file or they're being transmitted over your Wi-Fi. Um, they get transmitted over the internet digitally. They arrive. They have to go over the Wi-Fi. They get turned back into continuous waves, electric mag magnetic waves, that are then reinterpreted as digital things. So we're actually going through this process of switching back and forth between things that are continuous and things that are discrete multiple times. And in most technologies in the modern era, this conversion back and forth from digital to analog is happening repeatedly again and again and again throughout these chains. Okay. All right, this is not a course on digital signal processing, but I'm already pointing to you, out to you that on the very first slide, this dumb idea of a vector is everywhere, everywhere. And these things, when they're high dimensional, we often think of them as signals, and we can write them like this. You can imagine the signal that's interpolated between these. Okay, same things for images, just so you know. When you take a digital camera or you take your cell phone and you take a picture, it's pixelated, right? It's not, you don't have all the light that came into the camera at all possible locations that landed on the sensor. The sensor is divided into little buckets. They're little tiny uh, sensors that measure the amount of light, the number of photons that fall in each bucket. They measure it in terms of uh, different color, color directions. We're gonna learn more about color in two weeks as a nice example of, uh, of linear algebra. Um, and those things get recorded, again, discreetly. And now, the reason I'm bringing up that example is just so you know, now this indexing scheme that here is time is um, more abstract and harder to work with. You have to somehow index the positions on the two-dimensional sensor, and you have to lay those out in a vector. So typically that's done in scan lines. So you start at the top, I'm doing it backwards. Start at, let's say, the upper left, and that's, for example, how this screen is being painted. Right, you start at the upper left and you scan across, describing the intensity and color of each pixel as you go for however many pixels there are. Then you go back to the left side and you do it again for the second row. You do it for the third row, you do it for the fourth row. It's a lot of data. You get a thousand by thousand image, that's one million pixels. And if you're showing a video, the video is showing up at 30 frames a second, it's one million pixels 30 times a second. That video camera is capturing actually something much higher than that. So, so all of this, again, is digitized, discretized, and can be thought of as a big vector. Really, really big vectors. Vectors, vectors are flying around all around us. Okay, they're in the air. All right. Okay. Um, and why did, uh, why did that all happen? Well, I'm gonna leave that for, for you to think about. Why did this all, what happened? Why, why, did, why did we dump the LPs and go to the CDs? Why do we, why, and then, of course, then we went to the internet and we started to streaming things and we have Spotify and all these things. Why, why did we do all of that? Those LPs are pretty good. If you talk to the, the diehard audiophiles, a lot of them still believe that sound, sort of, sound quality peaked in the sort of 50s and 60s with analog, really, really high quality analog recording technology and storage technology. So why, why all the digital stuff? I'll let you guys think about that. I'm not going to answer. There are many answers. Okay. What do we do with vectors? So um, the, the basic operations are very simple. They, there's just a few of them. And once we understand those, everything else gets built from those. And, I'm, and we're going to land today on the most important piece of that. It is the, the sort of fundamental on which all of the other stuff gets built. So that's, that's going to be what we're aiming for. But let's start with this, scalar multiplication. What does that mean? It means you take a vector. Uh, oops, already squeaking. I'm going to multiply it by a scalar. I'll, I'll use A for the scalar, and I'll use X for the vector. A is just another real, real number. Okay. So I have A times X, and A is just going to be some number, and X is going to be some vector. And I'll just, for the, for the purposes of just illustrating this, I'm going to assume x is two dimensions, but it won't matter. So what is a times x? Um, it's just a new vector whose dimensionality is the same, and whose elements, individual elements, are all multiplied by that same factor a. So this, so 
scalar multiplication inherits from regular multiplication, the one you learned about in grade school. Um, and you just distribute that A, that multiplication by A, over all the elements of the vector. So they all get expanded by the same amount. So what's happening, if we think about geometrically, I started with x. That's x. Beautiful. What's better, fingernails on a blackboard or that ceiling? <laughs> I'm wishing for the fingernails, but you know, maybe you guys aren't. Okay. So what happens if I what happens if I multiply x by a? And uh, if I'm going to draw the picture, I better say something about what a is. Let's imagine a is two. What's the picture? Somebody want to give me an answer? Twice as long. Twice as long. Okay, but in the same direction. Okay, so it doesn't rotate it or move it around somewhere else on this plane. First of all, it stays on the plane. So this is an operation that's going to preserve the space that this vector lives in. This vector lies on this board. And when I do this to it, I'm going to operate on it by multiplying it by A. It's still going to lie on this board. It's not going to go jumping out into the room or into the next room or down the street. It's going to still be on, well, I guess if it's on this board, but I multiply it by 10,000, it's going to shoot off into the atmosphere. Um, but you know what I mean. Still on, the, still on this board, on the plane of this board. And it's just going to get longer or shorter. It's, it's still on the plane of this board, and it's still in the same direction. It's going to get longer or shorter. If I multiply it by 2, it'll come out here. That'll be 2x. I multiply it by half. And all new technology. If I multiply it by half, it'll get shortened by a factor of 2. If I multiply it by 1,000, it'll go out there by a factor of 1,000. If I multiply it by minus 1, it'll... It'll go back the other way. Exactly. Okay. So there's a line here on this board. And I can reach any point on this line by multiplying that vector x by a number that is appropriate to get me to that location on the line. So this vector x really defines a line. You should think about it that way. And all multiples of this vector x encode that entire line. I can get anywhere I want on this line by picking the right multiplier. If I want to get um, five units out from the origin, what do I have to multiply x by? Five? Not quite, because we don't know how long x was to begin with. So if x was already two units long, and I already introduced the idea of length, we'll talk about it in a second, but if x has some length in this coordinate system, and I want it to have, well, it has a length of two, and I want it to have a length of five, I have to multiply it by five halves, right? So a has to be five halves if I want it to end up having a length of five. So we now already have this idea of lengths. We have an idea of rescaling vectors by multiplying them multiplying them by scalars, right? That's scalar multiplication. Okay. Anything else I need to tell you? I don't think so. Zero. Oh yeah, we didn't do zero. Zero is special. Um, I can multiply by any number, including zero. If I multiply by zero, what happens? Zero. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, you can just look at this, we'll go back to the NAFT, right? I'm just gonna multiply this by zero, which is zero. I'm gonna multiply this by zero, which is zero. We're going to have what's called the zero vector. It's a vector filled with zeros. It's a special vector. It sits back here. That is a good noise. Yeah. Is it bad? Yeah, throw something at you. Okay, enjoy. <laughs> well, I'm up close. All right. So zero means that I end up right there. And notice that if I was multiplying by these scale factors to move this thing around, I can. I don't have to keep going back to x. I can just keep multiplying by different scale factors, and I can move anywhere I want on this line. I can multiply by 10, way up here, and I multiply that by um, 1 50th, and I come way back here, and I multiply that by negative 2, and I'm over here. And I can, I can basically move around on this line as much as I want. I can hop around all day. But if I multiply by 0, oops, it's just like with regular algebra. Once you multiply by something, something by zero, you killed it. It's gone. You really, that's, that, that kills it. You can squish and, con, and you can expand and contract these things as much as you want. You can even multiply them by the negative numbers. But if you hit zero, you just messed up. You, ju you just lost what you had. And now, once you made it zero, 
Now when you try to rescale that, multiply that by 100, if I'm sitting at the zero vector, I multiply it by 100, what do I get? Zero. So I, the zero vector is like a black hole. It's sitting here, and anything that goes in there, it's gone. So you, want to, you kind of want to stay away from that. And that's going to show up. That's, again, that's going to be fundamental in understanding what we can do with linear algebra, what we, what we reason about and understand linear systems. And when we think about singular value decomposition, that idea right there, it's already there. I'm just I'm, when we're talking about scalar multiplication. Yeah. Time. Half an hour. Half time. Do you want to get up and do a show? I don't want to do anything. I want to see some. I'm not a performance. I'm not stopping unless you're going to perform. In the past, we've taken a short break. I don't know if we want to do that today or in general. Does anybody want a short break? Go grab some water or something. Okay, take a short break. All right. <laughs> 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 gets twice as big. If they were negative, they get twice as big in their negative direction. If they're positive, twice as big in their positive direction, etc. Okay? And again, multiplying by zero means everything goes to zero. And this thing collapses back to that little black hole. So that's scalar multiplication. Next operation, addition. So addition also just inherits from the idea of addition with scalars. And um, I, I, you know, I barely need to write the math because you probably all pretty much know what it, what it's going to be. But let's write it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna. So we want to add two vectors together, and they're called I don't know. Let's say they're x and they're and z. So that's x1, x2, let's say, plus z1, z2. And that's just what you might, might guess, which is you add the components, sort of pairing them up, x2 plus x1 plus z1, x2 plus z2. They don't mix. Each component adds to its corresponding component. You get a new vector. It's the same size as the original vectors. You can only add vectors that are the same dimensionality. Right? So 
these two vectors, it only makes sense to write that x plus z, where these are vectors if they have the same dimensionality, because the, the way this is going to work is you're going to add up each, you're going to go pairwise down, the, down these elements and add them using plain old arithmetic, normal addition of real values. And you're going to do that for all of them, and, you, and every one has to have a pair. So you can't have two vectors of different dimensionality. It doesn't make sense to have, it's not defined to have no any way to add those together. So that's what we're going to do, and what does that correspond to geometrically? <coughs> you can kind of see what it'll be just by thinking about the graph, right? So if you have this vector that has two coordinates, and you have the other vector that has, I guess we'll do it green, and then blue will be our result. Um, let's say it's that. So this is z, and this one is x. And I want to add them together. What I have to do is add together the two first coordinates, add together the two second coordinates, and make a new vector that has those combined coordinates. It's just what the math is telling us. And what does that look like graphically? Anybody can know, knows off the top of their head where they've seen this before? Um, where, where is that new vector? It's going to be a two-dimensional vector, so I can draw it in the same plane that these two are living in. And where is it? How do I think about that? I heard a word. Parallelogram. Parallelogram, right. OK, so, so what we have to do is we take this thing and put it head to tail with the other one. So if I take, if I just transplant the z vector so that its tail is here and its head is up here, something like that, then that's the resulting vector. It's the, that's x plus z. Okay. And the word parallelogram came up because I can, I can take z and transplant it so its tail is at the head of x, or I can do it the other way around. I can take x and transplant it, but I'm do, imagine taking x and just sliding it along here, right? So it goes sliding up until it gets to here. And then those both give the same answer. So what I just proved to you graphically is that x plus z is equal to z plus x. It doesn't matter which order you do this in. Anybody remember what that's called? Something from middle school, maybe. Commutative property, right? Doesn't matter. This is an operation adding two vectors together. Doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. X plus C is the same as Z plus X. And that's just inherited from the commutative property that you have with normal scalar addition, right? You add two numbers, it doesn't matter what order you do it in. And that's the same thing here. So that parallelogram, that shape is a parallelogram. It has um, two parallel sides. I didn't draw them very well in terms of thinking <coughs> parallel, but there's two, the two red vectors are supposed to be parallel. Those are x. And the two green vectors are z. Those are parallel. And the combination of the two is what you get at this far corner, and that's the resulting vector x plus z. Okay. All right, now um, we have to take that. So we have to take that, and we have to combine that with um, again, I'm making sure that I have everything here right. So let's do the same thing that we did when we talked about scalar multiplication. If I now um, can combine these two things, I'm going to do some scalar multiplication and I'm going to add some things. So I'm going to take these two vectors, x and z, and I'm going to multiply them by, I get to stick a multiplier in here, so I'll call that ax, that's scalar multiplication. And then I'll write bz, another scalar multiplier. Um, and now I'm going to just, if I fix x and z, but I get to mess with a and b, what, do I, what am I doing? So let's first take x and double it. What, do I, what am I doing? If x doubles, then I'm just making it a, a vector over here. And that's going to take this, this thing and, well, it's kind of hard to draw, but now the green one will come off like this, and I'll get an x plus z that's over here. And in fact, if I rescale x, repeatedly, what I'm really doing is just changing the length of this side of the parallelogram. So I'm, I'm basically, and if I keep adding z to it, if I multiply x by 0 and add z to it, I just get z. So that's right here. If I multiply x by some tiny number and add z to it, I get something a little bit to the right of that. And I can, in fact, I can, if I do this for all multiples of x, i.e., I mess with this a, trying lots of values, including negative values, 
I'm going to, what am I going to cover? What, what points am I going to get to? Right, so when I did this for a single vector, I multiplied by a scalar. I covered a line, right? I could kind of fill out anywhere I want to go along that line just by multiplying by the right scalar I can get to. Now, I have <coughs> z plus ax, and I'm going to now adjust a. And now I'm going to be moving along here. I'll be, by adjusting a, I'll be moving along here. always offsetting by C and just adjusting A. So I'm going to cover again a line, but now it's going to be this line. It's not a line that goes to the origin because I won't, and, and in general, I won't ever get to the origin. I'll be in this line that's offset from the origin, this one up here. This is Z plus AX. I should have written that first, just AX plus Z. And if I now put in B, well, first I can do X plus BZ. What happens if I do that? Well, that's just taking x and adding different multiples of z to it. So this one I can think of as taking z and adding different multiples of a to it. This one, the other one, I can think of taking x and adding different multiples of z to it. That would give me this line. I can go anywhere in this line. So here, this is x plus bz for different b's, adjusting b. And this is AX plus Z, where I'm playing with A. So I go along that line, and I go along this line. And if I can play with both A and B, where, do I, where can I go? Where can I end up if I can adjust both A or B or both? Anywhere. Well, not anywhere. Anywhere on that can't get out to you. Out in the <laughs> anywhere on that. Anywhere, anywhere on the same dimension. Anywhere on the board, right. So I, now, I can cover the space. I can cover this entire space by adjusting A and B to put myself anywhere on this, on this board or beyond, but in this plane, I would say. Okay. So this is the idea that vectors um, at one vector allows you, and, and all of its multiples, allows you to cover a space, which is just a line. That's, with, that's a one-dimensional space. Two vectors allow you to cover a whole plane. So if I have these two vectors, I can cover everything in this plane. I can't get off of this plane, but I can cover this plane. And of course, if the two vectors I'm talking about were not these two drawn on the board, but they were, I don't know, two vectors and on the left hands, Linear algebra scales to any number of dimension, dimensions, but my hands do not. So if I have these two vectors and they point you know, like that, and I can make multiple, and I'm going to add these two together, or any multiple of these two, what do I now cover? Where can I go? Can I go anywhere in the room? No. I mean, these two vectors, we, can, we say they span a plane. They lie in a plane. There's a single plane and lay down a piece of paper against these two things. And that is that represents the plane that they lie in. And all multiples of these can move anywhere on that plane, but I can't get off of that plane. And I can't go over there. I can't go, go down to Mike. And I can't come back to my, my head. If Mike moves his foot over enough, I will get to it. Come on. <laughs> That's your halftime show. Okay. So, um, so a set of vectors essentially spans or represents a space. And it can serve as um, a way of getting to places in that space. And we're going to see more of that in, in more formal detail shortly. OK. Do you want to yet say when you don't get a plane? Yeah, I guess I should put in the, the bad spots. And that's we already hit that in the one-dimensional case. So when we did the one vector and all rescalings of that, we said, well, there's this one bad thing. If you hit it with 0, then you're back to the zero vector, and the zero vector is kind of useless. It, it, a zero vector can't be used to do anything. It doesn't point in any direction. It just sits at the origin doing nothing, and multiplying it by various scalars, it continues to be do, to do nothing. So it doesn't. it's not a useful vector. It's one to stay away from. The same thing is going to be true in two dimensions, but we're going to have another issue, which is that um, if these two vectors that we're using to define or lay out things on a plane, 
um, are pointing in the same direction, even if they have different lengths, so if I make one short and one long, but they still point in the same direction, then this trick, this idea that we just talked about, where you get to take multiples of one or multiples of the other or any combination and fill out the plane, that's not going to work because multiples of one of these is anything on this line. If, and if the other one points in the same direction, then multiples of that one are anywhere on the same line. And so, and, and the sum of two things that lies on that line will also be on that same line. So we really won't be able to get off that line. So if you, if it's bad luck if you've chosen two vectors and they happen to be pointing in the same direction or any multiple of that direction, including if they're in opposite directions. One is like a negative the other. That's, th that's not helpful. You need two things that actually are not pointing in the same direction in order to do this trick and to cover a plane. And you, you kind of know that, right? If that trick of laying down a piece of paper on these two and saying, okay, here's the plane that they define. You can't do that if they point in the same direction. There is no, if I lay down the piece of paper, there's a whole bunch of ways that I can lay it down that it will be consistent with both of these guys. They'll both be on it. And yet, there, there are many such pieces of paper. So you don't get a unique answer. There's not a unique plane that's defined by these two if they point in the same direction <coughs> or opposite directions. OK. So we're seeing these ideas are, are kind of very natural, very intuitive, and could be completely formalized. And they're, they're kind of underlying everything that we do in linear algebra. I think that's all I want to say about that. Yes, let's go on. So now let's define, I already mentioned the length of a vector, and it's what you think it is. It's like, how long is it measured in some units? So, you know, this thing, I could go get a tape measure and see how long is it. And if I made it twice as long, then its length would be twice as big. It's, it's exactly what you think it is, length. How do we measure the length of a vector? How do we write, so, so geometrically, it's kind of obvious, the length is, you take a ruler and you put it down on the thing and you measure it in whatever units you want. <coughs> what do we mean by the length of a vector mathematically? And in two dimensions, that's pretty easy because you've all had basic geometry and you all know how you measure the distance between two points. So if I draw a vector x and I want to know what is its length in terms of, you know, its, in terms of its coordinates, x1, x2, how do I do that? What's the length of that vector if I tell you that it's two dimensional and these are two coordinates? How do I measure what to this piece? Right, so there's a Greek name for that. There's like a rule that you're going to use to get the answer. Anybody can remember that? Right, the, the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so it's just about triangles, right triangles. Here we go, we draw a right triangle here. We say this is x1, this length is x1, this height is x2, and so the length of the vector from, from the origin to here is the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared. The Pythagorean theorem tells you that this thing squared plus that thing squared is equal to, what do you say, close to the nearest plus adjacent squared plus the, what's the far thing? There's a word for it. Uh, adjacent squared plus opposite squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared, something like that. Anyway, you all remember what it is, and it's pretty simple. The sum of squares, in the right triangle, the sum of squares of these two components is equal to the square of the, of the hypotenuse, the diagonal of it, right? So the length of, vec of x, if we wanted not the squared length, but the actual length, we write, let's write it out. Um, right here. We're going to notate this usually with double bars. Not everybody does. There are different notations, but let's start with this one. A little bit clumsy and maybe hard to understand why you have to use double bars, but let's leave it that way for now. So I'm going to write double bars, and I'm going to put a square there. Actually, let's get rid of the square. Um, and I'm going to write the length of x is equal to the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared. And that's assuming that x is two-dimensional. Okay? And it's just the Pythagorean theorem that gives us this. Um, if you Sometimes we'll leave out the square root, and we'll just express the squared length. It's kind of obvious, but we'll say this thing squared is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared. We won't put the square root there. We'll be talking about the squared length. And depending on what it is that you're trying to say, or prove, or understand, sometimes it's more convenient to work with the squared length. Sometimes it's more convenient to work with the actual length. So it's just about keeping track of which thing we're talking about. Um, 
How does it work in three dimensions? So if I had a third dimension coming out of the board, there would be an x3 here. What would the length, and this vector is now something that's coming out like that. What's the length of that thing? How do I do that? Ah, geometry is suddenly harder. Except that you can kind of do this recursively. Right? I see. Okay, so how does that work? Recursively. So you just, let's imagine that I draw this so that it's um, out of the board. It has a third component. And its first two components are just these two, x1 and x2. That's the third one that's out here. So the actual vector is this, the tip of my pointer. Um, and there's some distance from the board, which is x3. Okay. How do I get the length of this thing? Well, actually, let's just do it bit by bit. We first had the piece that's in the board. I already wrote it down. That means the, the squared length of this thing is the sum of squares of these two guys. Right? The actual length is the square root of that, but leave it as the squared length. And now, the, now I have another right triangle here that comes from the board straight out. There's a perpendicular coming out of the board from here to my pointer. And that right triangle, you, maybe you can't see it very well, but there's a right triangle whose the, 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 the adjacent side is this piece. It's this original x, the one in two dimensions. And the opposite side is the, this little stub that's sticking out of the board. That's x3. And so if I want to know the length of this vector, which is the actual three-dimensional vector, all I have to do is take the squared length of this two-dimensional piece plus the square of x3, the last piece, and add those together. So that means the squared length of the one in the board is x1 squared plus x2 squared. And the third piece is just x3 squared. I add those together and take the square root, and I'm done. So if it's a three-dimensional vector, it generalizes in the obvious way. You just add the third coordinate squared. And in fact, if it's a hundred-dimensional vector, you could go through, and we will not, a hundred such steps, tearing off one piece at a time, squaring it and adding it, and you would end up with this expression. We'll write it the way we would write it if we were writing math. How would we do this? introduce a little bit of notation, we might write something like this, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot 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 xn squared. Okay, so there's a general statement for vector length. The dot 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 meaning I left out a lot of terms here, or maybe I didn't leave out any terms, maybe there's only, maybe, maybe there were only two elements. The point is this is supposed to be a general expression for the sum of squares of the components. Okay? Another way we might write that is to give another piece of notation, because we're going to see this a lot in this course, is what we're doing here is we're summing over the indices of this vector, 1, 2, all the way up to n. So what we write right is a capital sigma, that means sum over, and we have to use a letter, a variable, if you like, to represent the index. So we're going to use a little m. From n equals 1 up to big N, so this whole thing, this is a shorthand notation that says sum over, compute the sum over something as little n goes from 1 up to capital N. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, until you get to capital N. And what are we summing? We're summing the component, the nth component of x squared. Okay? So this is a notation, a shorthand notation for that. So instead of writing this out all the time with dot, 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 We'll start writing sum over these things squared, where we're notating what it is that's changing as we go through the sum. The thing that's changing is the little n, that's the index of the vector. It's this, it's right here, x sub little n. Okay. Another thing to note is that making this step of writing it this way is sort of expressing it as a function, and that actually is parallel to the way you're going to write it in code. So if you're writing a piece of code to compute this, you would write a little loop that goes through and updates something, pulling out the nth element of the vector one element at a time, squaring it, and adding it up into some, some place where you're accumulating the answer. So, so this math notation is parallel to the kind of, at least conceptually, to the code that you're going to end up having to write in order to compute something like this. We're not going to be making you write code to do things like this, because this is a little bit too simple. But 
already the idea of what it takes to write code to do these things is starting to appear and emerge, even just in the notation. Okay. So that's the length of a vector. What's the length of the zero vector? Zero. Are there any other vectors that have a length of zero? No. Because the length is always positive. Why is it always positive? Because you're summing squared values. So those are always positive. If they started out negative, that's fine. But they become positive when you square them. So everything you're adding up here is positive. So this thing can't be negative. It's, it's going to be always positive, and then you take the square root. It's a good thing that it's always positive. Um, all positive numbers, you take a square root. What's the smallest this thing can possibly be? If I wanted to minimize this, I wanted to pick a bunch of x's to stick in here to have this value, the length of this thing, come out as small as possible. The smallest possible value you could get. Well, they're always positive. And I could make them smaller by, you know, taking this, for example, this first element and reducing it. But what's the smallest it can possibly be? Well, zero, right? I can't make it less than zero because if I go negative, it'll go positive again, right? Everybody knows the function. If I plot x squared, this is, if I have, or let's do it this. Here's x, and if I plot the function x squared, I get a parabola, right? So where's the minimum of that function? At zero. That's the smallest they can possibly be, and the value at zero is zero. And I can't get any smaller than that, because if I move to the right, it's going to go up. And if I move to the left, it's going to go up. So that's the minimum. Ah, okay, we just introduced another idea that's going to be with us throughout the course, optimization. If I want to find the minimum of a function, I'm trying to optimize something. <coughs> Where is the minimum value of this function? And in some cases, we're going to be able to answer that question in exactly and in what we call closed form write down an expression to give us the minimum. In other cases, you won't be able to do that, and you'll actually have to search for it. You'll, or you'll have a computer search for it, like search over the space to try to find the place where the function is smallest. So that's a foundational concept in really all of mathematics, and especially in data science. All the stuff that's happening right now with machine learning, almost all of it is really, in the end, about doing optimization in very high dimensional spaces. So, the fact that Google figured out how to do, how to recognize images or how to do translation from one language to another, they do this using very large complicated functions with tons of parameters and they optimize over those parameters in order to get the best possible translation based on data sets, large data sets that they have the training on. And it all comes down to fundamentally this basic idea. How do you find the minimum of a function? You write down the function, how do I find the minimum? Where, do, where is that? In the case of something like as simple as x squared, the answer is easy. We know what the answer is intuitively. We can also draw a picture, a graph, in one dimension, and we can point to the bottom of this hole. You can imagine, if you want to be physical about it, you drop a marble and you let it slosh around for a while. But eventually, you wait come back in half an hour. It depends how frictionless everything is. And, um, if you come back, where's it going to be? It's obvious, right? Unless you live in a very strange world, it will be sitting right here. It will have found the minimum. And that's how a lot of optimization happens, by dropping marbles and just shaking and waiting for them to get to the bottom of the bowl. Um, in some cases, you don't have to wait. You can calculate where the bottom of the bowl is, and you can jump to it. Okay? And we're going to, the class of problems we're going to be dealing with in the first few weeks of the course are the problems where you can actually jump to it. And they're, in fact, all quadratic. This is a quadratic optimization problem. This is parabola quadratic. And we know how to find the minimum of a, of a quadratic problem. You can just write it down. Okay. You guys probably remember how you factor quadratic equations, right? It's negative b plus or minus the square root of that stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's it for that. Oh, one, one little tiny thing. Um, anybody notice? Um, okay, we didn't get to it yet. Next. Um, okay. The most important operation. So everything we did so far. Scalar multiplication. Take a vector, multiply it by scalar. It just changes its length, right? Add two vectors together. You're putting them head to tail, right? And that gives us also these ideas that those two operations combined allow us to move around and cover what are called vector spaces. Okay. 
Uh, didn't do it yet because we're doing. Yeah, all right. Do it now. Fine. And then I'll do that. Part. So, a vector of length one is called a unit vector. One unit. It's called a unit vector. Um, normally, when we have a vector of length one, we will denote it if we were assuming a vector has a length one. Instead of putting an arrow over it, we'll put a little hat over it. So, and also sometimes we'll use the letter U as a reminder that it's a unit vector. Okay, so if we write that, that's usually going to be a mnemonic, or it's kind of a convention for indicating that it's a, this is a vector, but it's a unit vector. It has length one. So the length of this vector is supposed to be equal to one. If I have a vector and it doesn't have length one, I can always make it have length one. And how do I do that? If I have a vector of length two, what do I do? Right, divide it by two, or multiply it by a half, um, and that will make it have length one. So, in other words, um, I can always get unit vectors just by taking any old vector x and dividing it by its own length. Right? So that thing will be a unit vector. Unit vector. Um, and there's one exception to that, which you already know. Right? So if x has length zero, and I'm writing a piece of code to do this, I'm going to get an error because I'm trying to divide by zero. This is, if this is zero. If the zero, the zero vector has length zero, but the zero vector is the only vector that has length zero. There's no other vector that has length zero. So I'm in trouble if I'm sitting in that little black hole right at the origin. I can't do this. And the reason is very simple. This unit vector, what you're really saying when you make a unit vector like this is you're saying, you know, I don't care about the length of the vector. This, it doesn't matter. What I care about is the direction of the vector. I want to preserve the direction of the vector. I don't care about the length, so let me get rid of the length, or, or I'll make it some standard length, and typically we make it 1. So we divide, by, divide it by its length, and I have what's called a unit vector. And I can't do that with the 0 vector because it has no direction. It's directionless. You know people like that. <laughs> And I think you're thinking of them right now. <laughs> we won't ask for names. So, um, but everything else can be made into a unit vector. Because what you're really doing, you think about the whole space. What you're doing is you're taking all these vectors that are out there, all these points in this space, they have all different lengths measured from the origin. And you're pulling them back so that they have a length of one. And where do they end up when you pull them back so that they have a length of one? So there's one out here. You smash it down like that, so it has length of one. And there's one over here, you smash it over here, over here, you smash it over here. There's one that's really short, and you don't smash it, you stretch it out so that it has a length of one. You, right? Every, everybody's going to the same place. What's that place? Circle. If we do it on the board in one dimension, so, you know, this guy is way out here, and I push him back to that length of one. So here he goes. He ends up here. This one's over here, ends up here. This one's here, ends up here. This one's here, ends up here. All of these guys are ending up on a circle. We call it a unit circle. It's a circle of radius one. So in two dimensions, what you're doing is taking the entire board and you're pulling everything onto, everything outside of the circle is getting pulled down onto the circle, straight toward the origin, like it's a black hole. Everybody's getting sucked into the black hole, but they don't go to the black hole, they stop here. And if you're inside, you get pushed out away from the black hole toward this ring. Everybody ends up on this ring, unless, except for one, one poor vector that doesn't know which way to go. That's your friend that's directionless. Sitting right here and doesn't know, I don't know what to do. where did everybody go? <laughs> doesn't know what to do. Stuck at the origin. Doesn't have, a, doesn't have a way to break the symmetry, as we say it in physics or math. Right? There's a symmetric condition. That one at the origin doesn't know which way to go. Could go left or go right. And there's nothing random here to break the symmetry. You're not going to flip, could flip a coin. Right? It doesn't matter. Go left or right. Man, don't stand there. Um, but this one is stuck and doesn't go anywhere. Okay? So everybody's onto the circle except for the one at the origin. In three dimensions, OK, it's not a circle. It's a sphere, a unit sphere. And so, and in a hundred dimensions, it's something that's hard to visualize, but we call it a hypersphere. 
the set of points that, that are unit vectors in a hundred dimensional space is a hundred dimensional hypersphere. And it's, a, it's a surface that's hard to visualize or imagine, but just go back and, and do, do your visualization in two or three dimensions. It's like a sphere. It has the properties of a sphere. Everything is the same distance from the origin. Okay. So we now, by the way, have the two fundamental geometries that underlie, again, um, all of linear algebra, and a huge amount of optimization, a huge amount of signal processing, a huge amount of physics, reasoning, quantum mechanics, all kinds of things are built on these geometries. The two geometries are planar geometry, if you like. So this is like the geometry of lines and planes, and I didn't even tell you, but when you go to higher dimensional spaces, we call them hyperplanes. Okay? We can also call them vector spaces. That's another phrase that gets used a lot. So, so a set of vectors span a vector space, and it is a hyperplane. So if it's like a plane, in, in two dimensions it would be a plane, but in higher dimensions we call it a hyperplane. And the other geometry is the geometry of spheres, hyperspheres, if you like. And as we'll see, the spheres is going to include the general family, will also include ellipses, and ellipsoids, and hyper ellipses. Okay, so we're going to get to all of that, and all of that will come about from reasoning about these simple operations and quadratic things that we're going to talk about that have to do with that. All right, so the last thing for today is the most important thing, the last operation. And the last operation is called an inner product, sometimes called a dot product. Um, and that looks like this. We're going to notate it usually, the most common, again, there are conventions for this that are different. That's going to be one notation x dot z. So this is a dot that's kind of raised. It's not a period, it's a little bit higher. Um, and that kind of mnemonic for dot product, um, also, as I said, called an inner product. And let's just define what it is. That's going to be x1 times z1. We'll do it in two dimensions first. x2 times z2. So what is it? It's kind of weird. It's a mixture of a product and a sum. That's the first observation. It's got, it's got both multiplies and adding. So it's a little different than the other things we've looked at. And it's also different because the other things that we looked at are about taking vectors and getting vectors out. This is about taking two vectors and you get out a scalar. So this is a number. What comes out of this is taking these components, x, the x component and the z components, and combining them in such a way as to get out a number. This is not going to produce a vector, right? And this generalizes to multiple dimensions in the way that you might guess just by looking at the formula for two dimensions. You multiply this, these pair of coordinates, x1, uh, uh, elements, x1 and z1. You multiply this pair, x2 and z2. Then you multiply the next pair, x3 and z3. X pair, next pair is x3, x4 and z4, etc. And then you add them up. Okay? So um, sometimes, I, I think that it, of an analogy, it's kind of like a zipper. It's like you, you kind of pair these things up, add them up, and then you zip them all together and add them. So you multiply them together, pair, 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 multiply, 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 and then add them all up. Okay. So we can write that again in math. We were doing it in general with something, with something like this, the summation from n equals 1 up to capital N of xn times zn. Right? That's the product of the nth component of x and the nth component of z. I'm multiplying those for every little n, and I'm doing that for all little n's, and then I'm adding them all up. That's what this sigma is over here. This is a summation, right? Okay. So why would we do that? What's the point of adding up all those things to get out this number? It seems like a little bit of a funny operation, and like I said, it kind of looks like a hybrid of these other things. Um, well, let's start by, I think the way we're going to do this is we're going to try to understand what are the properties of this thing by peeling it apart. Okay? So let's first notice that this thing, which is the product of these two, x and z, um, what happens if I, how is it going to behave if I take one of these guys, let's say x, and I double it? What's going to happen to this thing? If x, if, if I double x, 
Well, we can kind of trace it through. If I double x, i.e., I take x and multiply it, and scale and multiply it by 2, um, then I take each of the components of x and multiply them by 2. So that means this x1 will be multiplied by 2, and this x2 will be multiplied by 2. And I could factor that out, right? Standard algebra. Factor that out, and notice that this entire thing will then be multiplied by 2. So doubling x leads to the, this dot product, or inner product, doubling. The same thing will be true if I double z. If I take z and I multiply it by 2, again, this whole thing will double. And if I multiply them both by 2, then the whole thing will go up by 4. Right? So, so whatever this thing is, <coughs> it scales with rescalings of the, of the two input vectors. So if I start with these two vectors and I rescale one of them, the whole dot product goes up by <coughs> the same amount. So that already tells you that whatever this is, it, I could, I should be able to write it as something that goes, it's like proportional to, let's do it that way. It's proportional to, I don't know, you probably haven't seen that sign, so it's a funny looking sign. It looks a little bit like, well, it depends who you ask. So there's a circle and then a half circle next to it. it kind of looks like an O next to a C, but they're connected. Like joined at the hip. It looks sort of like a, I don't know, a goldfish swimming to the left or an earwig. You know those, those funny little bugs with the, the little things in the back? No? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. I'm trying to draw an earwig. It's just like an earwig. It has a little head up here. It's got these funny looking things that come back like this. It sort of looks to me like this thing. Proportional to. Okay, in LaTeX, you write this with slash prop two. It, it's proportional two. Okay. So a little bit of math notation. We've got a bunch of math notation we've already put in here. Summation, proportional to, etc. Okay, so this thing is proportional to the length of x and the length of z. And I'm saying that because I already said if I if I change the length of either of these things, let's say I said double, but imagine you multiply them by a, and where a is any number you want, um, then this thing will change by that same factor. And in fact, if you multiply one of these by zero, then this thing will be zero. The whole thing will be multiplied by zero. So you know it's got to be proportional to the length of x and the length of z. It's not equal to the length of x times the length of z, but it's proportional to it. And what we have to figure out is we have to turn. We have to figure out how to make it. How to write something that's not about proportionality. We want to express it as an equality. So, what we've done. I didn't say this before. But I'll just say it now. If I take x, I can rewrite x as a product of. So take x as some vector, right? And I want to kind of break it apart into two two aspects of this vector. And the two aspects of the things I've been talking about all along. There's the length of this thing, and there's the direction that it points in. The way I'm going to do that is using the tools that we've talked about, right? I'm going to take this vector, I'm going to make it into a unit vector, and that captures the direction. How do I do that? I, I write x, and I divide it by that, by its length, right? And then, I can, if I want this to be equal, I'm going to write that. Okay? So what I have is, it's sort of trivial, right? This is obviously true. I take x divided by its length and multiply it by its length, I get back x. Duh. Okay, fine. But the, the real point here, the reason this is important, is I've really taken x and I've kind of separated it into two things. One thing is its length, that's this. Right? And the other thing is a unit vector, that's this. And I've separated out these two pieces. There's the length and then there's the direction. Okay. Now, thinking about the dot product, x and z, what I've just done is I've shown you that the dot product is proportional to the length of x and the length of z, it's proportional to both of them. And that tells you how it depends on their length, but it didn't tell you how it depends on the other piece, which is their directions. So in order to think about that, let's imagine, let's not worry about the length part, let's imagine I take x and z and I make them unit vectors. They're two unit vectors. And I want to know, what happens if I take a dot product of two unit vectors? Because if I can figure that out, 
then I know what happens if I take the dot product of any two vectors, because I can take two unit vectors and I can rescale them to be their, their original length, right? So I'm going to operate, I mean, let's just think about what happens with unit vectors, and then we'll put it all together at the end, okay? So let's imagine that I have two unit vectors, x hat and I have z hat. I'm putting hat over them because these are, this would be x hat, right? This is the length of x times x hat. What's the dot product between x hat and z hat? Well, let's do the simplest case first, and then we'll do the general case. I'm going to make it even simpler than the unit vector, so I'm going to assume that x hat is something that points along the x-axis. So what is a unit vector x hat that points along the x-axis? What, what, what goes into that vector? Let's write down the coordinates. So it has to lie on the unit circle, and I'm telling you it's this one, the one that points to the right. That means its first coordinate is 1, and its second coordinate is 0. And sure enough, that has length 1, because if I take 1 squared plus 0 squared, and I take the square root, I get 1. Okay? Everybody's with me, right? Okay, it lies on the unit circle, and it's pointing in this direction. So now, z hat, let's say z hat is over here. What are the coordinates of z hat? We didn't talk about this, but it's time to for trigonometry to make an appearance, and um, a lot of the things that we reason about are going to be using trigonometry. So how do I express z hat? It's a unit vector. It's in a two-dimensional space. And as I already told you, all the unit vectors in this two-dimensional space, they lie in the unit circle, a circle of radius 1. How do I express a point on the unit circle? Well, I could just write it has two coordinates, x and a x1 and x2, or z1 and z2, and they happen to have a constraint that they, the sum of their squares is 1. That's kind of a cumbersome way to write that. An easier way to write that is to say, well, actually, all I need to do is to express the angle, this angle. Okay? So we can call that angle theta. right? And if that angle is theta, then what is, how do I express this vector that has unit length and is tipped up from, from this axis with angle theta? Well, you can just kind of do, do your trig, draw that little tr right triangle, and say that if this is angle theta, then this piece, and, and this length is 1, it's a unit vector, what is the horizontal piece? That's the cosine, cosine theta. And what's the vertical piece? That's the sine theta. Okay. So we have a unit vector, and in fact, all unit vectors in two dimensions can be expressed as cosine theta, sine theta. So that's the unit. Those express the full unit circle. It's the theta expresses what angle you are relative to the, to, and it goes anti-clockwise relative to the horizontal axis by convention, right? But all you need is one angle, and that, that'll give you all those points, right? You can pick, pick the angle, and that'll give you something on that unit circle. Okay. So now, dot product. Here's x hat. Here's z hat. What's the dot product? You can just read it off. Remember how we do it? We take the first element, multiply it by the first element the second element, multiply it by the second element, add them up. So what do you get? 1 times the cosine, 0 times the sine. It's cosine. So here, the dot product, x hat dot z hat equals cosine theta. And that'll be true for any theta. So this is true no matter where z hat, where z hat is. I pick any z hat. If x hat is this guy, then the dot product is just the first element of z hat, the cosine. Now let's write the more general version of that. A little bit messier, a little more trig, but still not too bad. I'm going to cheat slightly and rely on something that, let's just do it. So we have, um, here's x hat. It's cosine of theta 1 and sine of theta 1. And now I'm letting it point anywhere it wants on the unit circle. And what's z hat? I'm going to write z hat is equal to cosine of theta 2 sine of theta 2. This is bad that I'm using subscripts. I used to use subscripts for indexing within a vector. Now I'm using subscripts 1 corresponding to x and 2 corresponds to z. That's ugly. Yeah, let's, let's erase those subscripts. I'm sorry about that. And let's make this theta x and this is theta z. These are subscripts that are just meant to remind you that one of these guys came from x and one of these guys came from z. We could also switch and use a different letter, but notation is always a pain in math. You should pick a picture back up. 
Yeah, so what's the picture? Again, we're on a unit circle, so one of these guys is over here, and the other one is wherever. Okay, there's Z hat, and there's X hat, and I'm trying to compute the dot product, and now I write it out. And what do I get? Product of these two, cos theta X, cos theta Z, product of these two, sine theta x, sine theta z, oof, it's like a disaster. That's cool, that's great. There's sines and cosines all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> it looks familiar to some of you. Now, somebody in this room looks at that and, and it looks familiar. Maybe half of you. How many people have seen something that looks kind of like that before? I'll bet you all have but you tried really hard to erase it. <laughs> it's so hideous. There were these trig identities in 11th grade geometry about cosines and sines of sums and, right, you know, combining, squaring things, cos squared, all kinds of trig identities. If you go look for trig identity in Google, you'll find tables of them, right? One of the most fundamental ones, and actually it turns out, we're gonna, so we just picked this one for this course, because we're gonna use it like four times. And each time it will open up a new window. It, it'll be the basis for all of, all of um, linear shift invariant processing. It's like the basis for understanding how to do convolution. It will also be a basis for this right now, for understanding the dot product. And it'll show up in a couple of other places. Okay, so this trig identity, says that if you have a cosine of one angle times a cosine of another angle, you probably saw it as something like this. Cosine A, cosine B, plus sine A, sine B, so maybe now it looks a little bit more familiar, probably saw it with letters A and B, um, is equal to, anybody remember? Cosine or sine? Cosine. Cosine, good. And? A minus B. A minus B, okay. Notice that it doesn't matter whether you wrote A minus B or B minus A, that's good because they're entering symmetrically. It doesn't matter if you write A minus B or B minus A because cosine is an even symmetric function. The cosine of, a, of an angle is equal to the cosine of negative the angle. It doesn't matter. So the sine doesn't matter, so flipping A and B doesn't make any difference here. A, B minus B, B minus A, same difference. Okay, so that slightly messy thing with all sines and cosines turns into something that's pretty simple which is the cosine of the difference between them. So this is equal to, so that means our dot product is now just the cosine of theta x minus theta z. And in this picture, what is theta x minus theta z? Uh, too many pen caps. Theta x minus theta z, so theta, theta x, just to be clear, theta x is over here, right? It's measured from that horizontal axis. And where's theta z? Well, that's, you know, in here measured, again, from the horizontal axis. But the difference between them is, it's, it's simple, right? It's just the angle between the two vectors, right? So this, this angle between these two vectors is theta x minus theta z, or maybe it's the, theta z minus theta x, but I already told you that doesn't matter. So the, di so the angle between the two vectors is actually the thing that's gonna matter. If you take two unit vectors, the dot product of two unit vectors is just the cosine of the angle between them. That's it. This is an, an unbelievable fact. It sounds like, yeah, yeah, so what? It's one of those trig identities. It's much more than that. We, the point is that we now have something, here's why this is profound. We start with something where we have coordinates, x1 and x2. In Euclidean geometry, we, we, make, we describe things in terms of coordinate systems. We have a horizontal coordinate, we have a vertical coordinate, right? We're taking these two vectors, x and z, we're combining them in, in a way we're smashing their coordinates together in this funny way to get out a number. The number we get out doesn't actually matter, it isn't going to depend on the coordinate system. What's going to matter is the angle between the vectors. So if I were to rotate these two vectors around, so it's the same two vectors, but I just rotate them around, the angle between them is the same, their dot product will be the same. It doesn't actually, and if, or if instead of rotating the two vectors, I were to take my coordinate axes and just say, well, I don't really like this horizontal and vertical coordinate axis, I'm just going to rotate my coordinate system and use a different coordinate system, and that still doesn't affect this. 
So even though these vectors are expressed, they're written down in terms of some coordinates, x1 and x2, z1 and z2, in the end, when you take a dot product, those coordinates aren't going to really matter. What's going to matter are three things. The angle between the vectors, that's this piece. The cosine of the angle between the vectors. And of course, we, I left out the thing that we dropped by the wayside, which was over here, that this was um, goldfish swimming to the left, proportional to the product of two of their lengths. We dropped it out because here we were assuming the unit vectors, but if we put all this back together, the dot product of these two things expressed in some coordinate system is equal to the product of the length of the first one, the length of the second one, and the cosine of the angle between them. So the, cos the, the, the dot product is, has taken something about these two vectors expressed in some coordinate system and has handed something back to us that's about their geometry. It's about the angle between them and their lengths. So that is where all the power is going to come from. That's where, the, that's where the pictures come from. That's why we can reason about these things and draw pictures of them. Because this dot product thing, this operation, is really embodying a lot of geometry. So we're going to work with that. But notice, think about a little bit, and we'll, come, we'll get to it next time, but think about a little bit what happens if the two vectors are pointing in the same direction, what happens to their dot product? If they're perpendicular to each other, what happens to their dot product? If they have the same length, what happens to the dot product? What happens if you take the dot product of a vector with itself, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do? You can take x dot x. What does that give you? And think through those things, and we'll go through all the rest of this next time. Okay, see if there's next.